<laughs> on that note, I think we should get started. Um, we've got folks uh, coming into the room with us. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, really appreciate uh, both our panelists and our audience for joining in tonight. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. We're excited to host this discussion about anti-racist organizing um, and uh, a new book from PM Press. It did happen here, an anti-fascist people's history. Um, people may already be familiar with some of the content here as a result of the fantastic podcast that predates it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Uh, before we do so, I'll just say that Firestorm is a 14-year-old radical bookstore, oh, 15, my notes need to be updated, 15-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. Uh, we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. Uh, we're also continuing to offer events like this one, both um, online and uh, in some cases now in person, uh, because we do know that uh, COVID continues to pose a barrier to many people in our community. Uh, and we will be hosting conversations on uh, queer abolitionism, the ritual power of poetry, and collective strategies for weathering state repression over the next month. So if you're interested in those topics, I would encourage you to sign up for our newsletter uh, or follow us on social media. Um, we will continue to share about events there. So note to everyone joining us that tonight we are using Zoom's Q&A tool. Um, if you are joining us on Zoom, uh, you can find that probably at the bottom of your screen, maybe different on a phone. Um, if you're on Facebook, uh, you can drop a comment below the stream and we will do our best to answer the questions that we get. We really would appreciate audience uh, engagement. It's always a lot more fun when we get a little bit of a sense of who's out there. So uh, let's get started. Uh, tonight, like I mentioned, we um, are really privileged to have, uh, I think, six contributors from It Did Happen Here. Uh, Coyote Amrich stepped behind a camera when she was 15 and found a way to share with others how she viewed the world. Fortunate had to, been, to have been raised in a household that valued activism. Coyote has been protesting injustice since she was young, from roller skating at the front of early pride marches in Portland, Oregon, to being a fixture at anti-war and anti-hate demonstrations. Documenting these protests and political actions was an extension of that, giving Coyote a purpose beyond participation. Mo Balstern is an A-Zone alum, a writer, laborer, Fisher poet, and DIY social practice artist. Mo is the longtime editor of many publications, including uh, the commercial fishing zine, uh, Extra Tough, she was a writer on both the book and podcast ver versions of It Did Happen Here and lives in Portland, Oregon. Uh, John Bear grew up in Portland and in his teen years actively confronted white supremacist gangs there. He was a founding member of the Portland United Baldies and during a tragic encounter that escalated into a gunfight, uh, Bear inadvertently shot and killed the lead singer of a neo-Nazi rock band. Bear spent his 20s in prison and on parole before returning to Portland to become a skilled carpenter, husband, and father to five children. Now living in LA, he continues to be an activist against fascism with a uh, deeper understanding about the inherent consequences of violence. China is a dedicated activist, community organizer, doula, and educator. She is the founder and executive director of Muslims United a nonprofit that makes space for Muslim women's leadership, um, as well as the Hidayah Women's Resource and Advocacy Project, an advocacy program for Muslim survivors of violence. She's worked at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry and as a science teacher at the Islamic School of Portland. China attended Tuskegee University and went on to earn her BS in biology at Portland State University. As a teenager, she found herself fighting fascism on the streets of Portland. Michael Clark is a proud small business owner and father of three great kids. He's been active in the recovery community in Portland for the last 17 years and is thankful for the opportunity to be of service. Jonathan Mazzocchi um, was a founding member of the Portland-based Coalition for Human Dignity 
and spent much of the 1980s and 90s specialized in research and intelligence that targeted the far right. He currently blogs at ghostsofantifascismpast.org. Welcome all of y'all. I look forward to hearing a little bit more about your stories and appreciate you taking time with us. Uh, I think uh, Mo is gonna get us started and share just a little bit about uh, the book and podcast that we're here to talk about. Hi everyone, Dad, we can't see. And I wanna just say thank you so much to Liberty and Firestorm for the invitation and for everyone to uh, who's taken time out of their day to show up. Uh, Coyote in China, and Jonathan, Michael, and John. If you um, are someone familiar with the podcast, you may recognize their voices. You can close your eyes during the this Zoom and see if you guessed right. You can play a little game. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the book and the podcast, I guess, um, the process, where we came from. Um, I also want to acknowledge a panelist who's with us all the time. Um, and I just the, the, our ancestor, Mulugeta Sarau, who was terribly murdered at the close of, um, 1988, which was an event that happened in Portland, November, 1988, um, Mulugeta, who is a father, a brother, a son, and a beloved nephew, member of the Ethiopian community, um, beloved worker and student at PSU, and he was trying to break up a fight that had um, happened between himself and his friends that he was with, and three white power skinheads, members of East Side White Pride, who were clogging, they were, they had an altercation in the streets and um, a piece of that story that doesn't always get told is that the girlfriends of the guys were in the car and they egged them on, which is the impetus that Ken Miski had to get out his bat. And Mulligated did not survive the night and the news hit Portland really hard. And from there, people got together to organize in a um, bunch of different ways. And the book tries to tell that story um, using the tools that we have and the podcast as well. Um, as far as how the podcast and the book got started, um, both, so Mike Crenshaw um, and Aaron Yankee came together through KBU uh, and they also found um, Selena Flores and the three of them began working on the podcast um, after they were able to find some funding through the Marla Davis Fund, which was um, put set aside to fight the Christian right. And this was a story that both Mike and Aaron had separately wanted to tell for a long time. Um, it's, it's Mike's story in a big way. And they pulled the rest of us in we got the podcast. Uh, they started work. Aaron started working on interviews. I don't even know, maybe four years ago, five years ago. And then during when we had lockdown, we suddenly had time available and they pulled uh, Julie Perini and me and Alec Dunn in to make it happen. And, and I know some people were working um, in the streets fighting for freedom, like just trying to stand against police violence, police brutality, capitalism, imperialism. And the podcast was dropping. And it was what one of the things that's interesting, maybe for you to know, is that we were also listening to what was happening in the streets and trying to respond with the podcast because it was being made as we were all living in that moment. And then PM Press invited us to do a book and we thought it would be really easy. We would just transcribe the book, not a big deal. Like it wouldn't take any time at all. And then Alec Dunn, who has the most experience with books was like, you guys, those books are unreadable because there's so many voices that are happening. So, um, you know, we had to reorganize the whole thing. And and for both the podcast and the book, Aaron Yankee, who is is not 
she she's not here today she's not she's like really loves being behind the scenes and bringing people together and making things happen and so it's easy for people to not see the person who's kind of doing that she created the structure of organizing things into episodes and organizing things into chapters and then Alec and I went and filled in uh a lot of the narration Mike also helped out with the narration and Selena and Mike with with their beautiful narration and I mean it was just like a very synergistic experience um without a lot of communication or organization and the book was similar to that except Alex stepped back from the writing and he did the layout and I and I want to say that like three of us are zine editors who still make zines like today like I'm literally releasing them now you know and um I think that had a big impact on the way the book looks because it really like Alec has a ton of experience designing art activist books with his signal series if you've ever seen those also from PM press and we don't have any internalized structures of academia or book publishing world telling us what we could or couldn't do and so we just really felt open to deciding how things would move forward and we um a guiding principle for all of us was um was just like being able to hold this story for everybody in a more in an honorable way the a way that honored the story and also just like we understand people are giving us their stories and giving their stories to the world through this book and podcast. And it's not um, always easy to have somebody have your story in somebody else's hands or control. And um, we wanted to make sure that people felt good about that. And that also this story exists in what we've been understanding is like an information or a digital shadow because the eighties and the nineties haven't been digitized. It's hard to look this stuff up. It was very difficult to find any information as the person that was doing a lot of the research for both the book and the podcast. It was really hard to find anything. So um, it's amazing that uh, this book has started to become a piece of primary history. And the last thing I'm gonna say about it is that we're so proud and excited that the Oregon Historical Society has hired some of the team to create a curriculum, which will then be um, offered to be taught in Oregon schools, high schools, if teachers elect to uh, move forward with that. So I hope that helps. And then, you know, obviously there's a Q&A later. So if I didn't get to anything, you can put in a question about that. And now I'm, it's, um, I'm gonna ask the panelists uh, a couple of questions, starting with John, uh, what your, I think you were one of the first interviews, John, and I think Aaron was just like, and you really opened some doors for Aaron. The interviews for the podcast and the book were conducted mostly by Mike, Selena, and Aaron. 80% um, of them were conducted by the three producers of the podcast and my co-authors, and um, John everybody was kind of vetted through old social networks that we have maintained for the last 30 years. So we have all stayed in community to some degree. And John was like, oh, Aaron, you know this guy, he says you're okay, then I will talk to you. And then John opened a bunch of doors for us. And I wanna know what that, you know, like how that was for you or actually anything that you guys wanna talk about in terms of your experience with the book, the podcast, having your story told. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mo. Um, yeah, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, it, it's it's interesting. I'm I'm having a flood of different thoughts and memories. Um, I felt um, well for a long time. I felt uh, ashamed and embarrassed about my story and my history, and it was something that I tried to. I, I wanted to close the door on and not talk about, and I was always worried that if employers found out, if people found out, there'd be all this judgment. And, and for a long time, I was worried about real life repercussions from, uh, from neo-Nazi groups. And um, 
for many years, I started to feel this kind of growing, like um, I was really starting to feel compelled to, to share my story. And I, I don't even know what I thought the benefit of it would be, but I did feel that it had some value and I was starting to really feel like I wanted to share it. And I was kind of afraid to for a long time. And I finally um, decided I was going to do it. And that just happened to be in this time period um, that Mike was trying to get his his book going and he was collaborating with Aaron and and I, I would, I've been told that I was the first interview um and that's that's exciting and I went down and I met with Aaron at the Kebu uh you know headquarters and we we talked for a couple hours and um something that you made reference to in in your introduction that I've really always loved and appreciated about this podcast is that um it lets everybody tell their own story in their own words and in their own voice. And I never felt like someone with an agenda was trying to make their point with my words. And um, that means so much to me. And, um, you know, I think as far as sharing my story goes and sharing my experience, by the time I finally decided to do it, I kind of felt like I really missed the boat. I should have done this 15 years ago. I should have done this 20 years ago. And what I've learned from the reaction to the podcast is that I didn't miss the boat. It's still relevant. It still matters. The, the interests um, and the struggles that are going on in the streets are still relatable. Um, and I'm so happy that I did make that decision to kind of not be ruled by my fears and, and to do this thing. And I'm so proud to be a part of this um, project that has grown and seems like it keeps growing. I don't even know where this is going to lead next, but we all have valuable experiences and we, not everything we did worked and um, the things we did that failed or didn't work right are, are also valuable. So I'm just so happy to be a part of this group. Thanks, John. Uh, can we just roll right into Michael? Thank you, Michael Clark. Hi. Um, I want to thank you for the invitation to come and share today. Um, I really appreciate uh, seeing uh, my fellow panelists here. Um, <clears throat> I was asked, I've been friends with uh, Mike Crenshaw and uh, John Bear um, since my early teen years. Um, I've been friends with Mike ever since he moved uh, to Portland. Uh, from the Midwest. And so we have a long, long history. Um, when I was asked to share in the podcast, I think one of the things that was really important to me to share was the reality of what 1988 Portland was like and 1989 Portland was like. Um, I have a 15 year old son home today who can't believe the things that were happening in the city or that um, a man was beaten to death uh, for the color of his skin right down the street from where I live today. Um, and who asks a lot of questions about how, how, did, how was that acceptable? How did we get there? What has changed? I don't see that happening. And uh, I get to spend a lot of time uh, going through uh, the news reports on any given day of where it's happening every single place that we look and that we see. Um, I have a long history with uh, different skinhead gangs and things of that nature. And uh, um, I luckily had the luxury of going down the drain with drugs and alcohol at a relatively young age and falling apart. Um, and uh, getting an opportunity to put my life back together and kind of reinvent myself. Um, since uh, I've been sober since 51706. And when I got sober, I also made a commitment to not be violent. Um, violence has always been a big part of my life. Um, I still can be a fan of violence. I still believe it has a place. I don't think that, um, I think that some change is it requires. But uh, today I choose to do things a little differently. Um, and I've maintained that commitment to nonviolence in my life uh, for the last 17 years, um, which has been amazing. I've been able to be someone who people can come to 
and, and who has information to share and who has strategies to share. Um, one of the big points that I really was trying to get across uh, in my interview with Aaron for the podcast um, was to make sure that people didn't get the impression that everything was altruistic because it's very easy to, I think, see that, oh, anti-racist, fighting the good fight. And, and while, while that's there and while that was important and while people felt very strongly about that and were willing to uh, risk their safety and their own physical well-being uh, to make a stand against the neo-Nazis that were running around Portland, um, I had shortcomings in a lot of other departments, as did a lot of the people that we hung out with. Um, and you know, one of the things when skinheads against racial prejudice actually became a thing, um, there were a lot of different rules and nuances to what was and was not allowed. And uh, I was anti-racist to the core, and I didn't want to hear about anything else that was unacceptable. Um, uh, they have policies on misogyny and all kinds of other different things. Um, and I wasn't quite as developed as I thought I was at the time. And I think that that's something to, uh, that's something that needs to be owned. And really when doing these types of events, the thing that I've really found is choosing the thing that I can affect change with the most versus, you know, you have to, you have to be aware of all the, all the things that are happening, but, uh, choosing the thing where I can affect real change the most and going with that and becoming an expert at, the, at that thing and understanding my own nuances of, uh, of where I fall short, even in the things that I know the most about on a daily basis and uh, allowing other people room to be human and just trying to lead by example. Um, I have uh, a beautiful wife and a 15 year old stepson who I just adopted um, they're both uh, practicing Judaism, and we have a lot of talks about that um, and about the really nuanced and interesting ways that uh, privileged people who don't have reason to think about those things um, fall into categories of active racism, anti-Semitism, all of these things that are pretty much a, a standard in America that, uh, that we need to knock down brick by brick. So uh, um, I want to thank you for having me. And it's really good to see all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Really, uh, and, and John, you two both were um, kind of more in the baldies and sharp side of things. We we're going to turn now to Jonathan Mizaki. And uh, Jonathan, could you share a little bit about your experience with the book and a personal intro introduction for yourself? You bet. Thanks, Mo. Can you hear me uh, okay? You sound great. Okay. I'm glad. Um, uh, the folks uh, who, who wrote um, uh, and, and produced and, you know, put, put together the original podcast got, got a hold of me. Um, fairly early on, and I was really tickled, um, you know, mainly because that whole time period, as Mo had uh, mentioned before, was really much of um, the activism, much of the important stories that have been told. Back, back then, they were lost. They had not been digitized. They were not available. Um, and, uh, you know, this this book, can you see that? Uh, no, maybe it's blurred. All right. Well, it's, you know, it, it did happen here. The book um, and the podcast, thank you, Liberty, um, what was remarkable. And uh, I remember very early on when I was interviewed um, that there was care taken. There was uh, folks were very conscientious about um, how our stories were told, how we were presented and whatnot. And I felt I'm very at ease with the folks who interviewed me and even more at ease uh, when when the uh, podcast, as, as it came out every week, I thought there was a, a, you know, a sense of authenticity that went with it. And it was a, a really important corrective uh, to a, a great deal of 
um, uh, folks who have written things about that time uh, that I, you know, didn't agree with back then and don't agree with today. Uh, by way, a little bit of background, I came into the anti-racist struggle in Portland, Oregon in the late 1980s uh, through uh, some university organizing around anti-apartheid work, uh, anti-apartheid in South Africa, um, and uh, Central America solidarity work. I did that work for a few years as a young student, um, and then uh, began to develop with a few people um, um, a res what I call today a research capacity. And by that, I just mean we began to assemble files, books, you know, create a little library on um, the far right, far right forces locally, regionally, internationally, so on and so forth. We felt that research needed to be an important part of um, progressive and left struggles. Uh, and back then, as uh, I think Mo also pointed out, the information environment was, you know, radically different from today. Back then it was print radio and tv and that's it right there's that that is it and you uh, so everything moved kind of slower and if you wanted to get a handle on um what some you know far right groups were doing in your area it it took um a lot of labor and it took a, a great deal of organization library science skills it just you know took a lot of that kind of stuff so my involvement was on the um um, in fighting racist skinheads, uh, together with uh, anti-racist action, skinheads against racial prejudice, my organization that I helped found, the Coalition for Human Dignity, um, really prized research um, in, in order to inform uh, community-based efforts to counter far-right insurgencies. That's pretty much what we did. And I think um, uh, the podcast and the book and the forthcoming curriculum go go a long way towards um, respecting that uh, unique kind of contribution to that effort. Um, and today, uh, I think that's, um, um, you know, very important. It continues to be very important, that, that research angle. And thankfully, you don't need a, a, a great deal of overhead. You don't need filing cabinets and copy machines and lots of computers and clipping services. Uh, folks are doing the kind of work we did back then with their phone, which I think is remarkable. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the far right is doing the same thing. They're doxing us. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, leave it there. I'm just very appreciative of all the work that the folks have done on the, on the podcast and the book. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. And also just thanks for saying nice things about the book. Um, Coyote, we, your, your, um, voice is included in the book through the many images that you let us use. And one of the very remarkable things to me about those images is how, when I look at the photos, it's so clear to me that the person who is represented in the photograph has a relationship with the person take behind the camera. And that really shines through. And I, I love that. And, and I thank you for that. And I just found out you were quite young when that was going on. So uh, what was your experience like? Yeah, well, I was 14 when Malaga was murdered. And um, I was really lucky to have been raised, like I said, in an activist household and, and really um, in by a lesbian, single parent mother. And what that did was it put our existence in the 80s was not a thing. So I was already kind of an outsider in the world and looking at her different struggles. And she was in, really involved in activism in Portland. All the things that Jonathan talked about, like <laughs> were things that she was involved in. She was, um, so activism and protests, like I, I joke, but I didn't eat grapes while I was in college because you just didn't eat grapes and like, I didn't really realize until I had graduated, like in the early 2000s, I was like, why do I eat grapes? Like people eat grapes and I never had grapes and it was because of the protests um, and the boycotts. And so it was just kind of my, my foundational DNA. Um, so I was 14 when he was murdered and that was about a year before I got a camera for 
I don't know, my birthday or the holidays for my uncle. And my relationship to his murder was slightly personal because, um, and I think that you sort of touched on the women in the car, um, their participation, they were, one of them was the older sister of two twins that I went to middle school with that were part of a friendship group of all kinds of people of us all hanging out. And we had absolutely no clue that they were involved in Eastside White Pride, that their dad was a KKK member, that like all of those things, just absolutely no clue. So the murder, her participation, that kind of unraveling of like hidden fascism was bewildering. And I think that that period in history for me as a young person who went to shows all the time, my mom was a on the queer side of concert promoting, but she knew all the concert promoters. So my salvation as a 12, 13, 14 year old from my life was to go to shows at Pine Street and to just immerse myself in music. And luckily I didn't have, you know, some of the issues that others had. Um, and I just kind of like had a, one of the doormen was my mom's friend and he was massive. And so I just had someone looking after me at all times. Um, so, but, uh, once I got my camera, I, it just gave me a place in the world. It gave me a way to like show people what I saw, but also like take pictures of somebody or people who would never let me just like stare at them. <laughs> like People in my, like I hung out with punks. I hung out with a bunch of kids downtown, in downtown Portland. And I would just document us and like what we were doing. And I've talked to John about this. I have, n I like, I, I had a complicated childhood and so I don't have a ton of memories. And so I'm like, how do I even meet you guys? Like, how did we start hanging out? But I just know that like, for me, there was, and there was a comfort because I was, I was just allowed to just like exist and be in my complicated, super messy self. And then just to document our lives. And I think that, I didn't always understand exactly what was going on on um, some of the some of the pieces. I didn't understand how some of the people that we hung out with were allowed to hang out with us. <laughs> I didn't understand the complexities of um, people who were supposed to be anti-racist hanging out with people who are racist. And it was just all very confusing because I sort of came from like, you are or you aren't and you do or you don't. And um, and yeah, so I just, I just documented every day and every night and my friends and people that were my community and that kept me safe and it was great. So yeah, and I'm super honored. Like John called me or DM me or something and he's like, hey, do you know about this podcast? Like, you got to listen to it. I was like, no, I had no idea. And listening to it, I was like in the pandemic, in my room, like cleaning, just sobbing <laughs> because it was like legit our life and I was just like oh this is so intense to like relive this wild time like sitting at John's sentencing literally with gauze in my mouth because I just got my wisdom teeth full because <laughs> I was a kid you know just being like gauze blood just waiting for my friend to get sentenced and like just crazy thank you so much Coyote, and especially um, for bringing the emotion into it. And I have heard that from several people who participated. Um, and that also that, you know, just reading the book, taking time with reading the book, taking time with going through that stuff. And um, that is part of sharing the stories is like reliving them um, and how things were and how they could be different and how it changed you. Um, now we come to China, if you could share some responses and sh tell us a little bit more about yourself that's not in the bios or the, and welcome and thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, I've just been spending, been very interesting listening to everybody else talk and kind of hear, you know, their perspective on that scene that we were all kind of a part of um, different ends in different places. Um, 
when Mulugeta Sara was murdered, I was 16 and I was part of a group of people that had been, you know, pretty actively challenging these white supremacists. And we knew all those guys that killed Mulugeta Sara. We knew, we knew them. And we'd actually had a run in with them. I think it's in the book, like the week before. And I almost, you know, that almost got me, you know, but I was protected. Um, actually, there was just like, they were so amped up. And I just remember like 20 white guys with their shirts off, like shouting and full of rage about what well, do white, angry white racist, what are they mad about? I don't know. But they were full of rage and screaming and, you know, uh, not going to use that word, but they were like, kill the inward bitch. Okay. Um, meaning me, because I was the only um, black person there, only black girl. And at the time, I, you know, I was like, you know, like 125 pounds, small frame. And I mean, it was pretty terrifying, but, you know, I'd learned being who I was to put on this like face of strength, you know, but I didn't feel that strong inside, but I was like, you know, holding myself together. Anyway, back to this. So that was a, a week before we had that run in with them. And when we heard that they'd killed somebody, we were just, there was a bunch of us in this apartment that we're all hanging out in and we were just all devastated because it kind of like, you know, it hit us. This is, we knew that we felt that it was real, but it just gave this, this very ominous feeling to how serious, truly serious this um, stuff that we were involved in was someone had lost their life, you know, and it could have been us. And I remember we were crying and we got drunk and we were just like, what the, you know, what are we going to do? And, you know, building up that anger and just like, you know, just really grieving, even though I, I mean, I didn't know Mulligata personally, but I grieved um, his murder and how unjust that these people could take a bat to him and just beat, you know, beat him for no reason. And that his family had come here looking for a better life. And it's just, you know, you know, there was, for me, there was a lot of pain. I'm listening to everyone's stuff in that whole movement. And I was there, there were good times, um, but there, I was also there kind of because I needed to be. And I was fighting these Nazis because they were coming at me. You know, I was just, you know, I like, I was a punk rock. I mean, I hung out, I was a punk rock kid. I hung out with Sharp and stuff, but I was like, you know, I was listening to Clash and Sex Pistols and, you know, true punk rocker. I was on that, you know, anarchy as a philosophy, like, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm a Muslim, but I kind of consider myself like a anarchist Muslim, but that's another story. But, um, you know, it was, it was a really intense time for me. And um, what I'm taking away from the book and hearing everyone's story is how, how different our lives were, but yet we were all um, connected in this movement. You know, we're coming from very different places in some ways, but you know, a lot of us came from a working class background. I came from a working class background. Um, a lot of us were out there for that. I remember there were some kids that used to come down on the weekend. They were more like middle class and had money, but we were all down there together, you know, in spite of our different classes. Um, and I was one of the few um, black kids. There was a few other, there was Richard. He was a black skinhead. Um, Sometimes he was, so Coyote kind of mentioned this. Um, some, he was a black kid, but sometimes he was actually black and Native American. Sometimes he was like Mussolini youth and spouting this white supremacist stuff. And you're like, but that's kind of what it was to be, um, you know, down there for some people. And, you know, whatever his life experiences had been that led him to kind of have that self hate and identify with this force that hated him, that's what was there. I mean, I was very grounded and really hated racist, but I remember having to come to an awareness of that they hated me. They hated me, you know, like they were like, oh, inward, inward. I'm not going to use the word because um, I don't use it. And I don't think anybody should use it. And then they'd be like, oh, not you. I was just a, a young girl. Your um, your nose isn't wide or something. I remember sitting there thinking, not quite having my voice yet. Like, what are you, are you talking about? My dad, my sisters, you know, I just remember like, um, this kind of coming up, like this ev evolution of this enraged, like really angry person that came out of just kind of dealing with this, this bullshit of this racist, hateful, racist people, just kids, but mostly older than me, but just this, um, this kind of swirling up of this rage that I, um, 
kind of mounted at a point that brought me to the place where I was like going to confront these grown guys because they were a lot of them big, big guys and stuff. I was going to confront them. I, I like became fearless. Just that rage in me that, you know, that just that at that injustice really um, just kind of woke up in me after hearing so many things. And also, I mean, we're talking about being a woman, being, you know, a woman, like hearing about the disgusting shit that some of these guys were doing, excuse, excuse the cursing. I don't know if there's kids here, but just like using a woman, like, 12 guys going in a room, excuse me for being graphic and using a girl at night. That's the kind of stuff that was happening. And these, some of these guys were anti-racist and just the really um, disgusting, uh, for lack of a better, misogynistic, just like sexist tropes. And a lot of the girls didn't have the words to, they didn't know what was going on. They were kind of like, you know, a bit of groupie, kind of be groupies and stuff. And I, I was kind of a like strong badass, like back then I remember defending girls and stuff, but really not, having a full understanding of what was happening of, you know, I didn't have the language of misogyny back then. You know, I have it now. I know that word now. And I, um, that's part of, part of what happened back then is kind of formed the work that I do now. I, I run an organization that offers um, protection, um, support to women, Muslim women, Muslim women of color, but all women who are um, victims of crime. Um, and it's from a lifetime, I'm 50 now, of watching women, specifically women of color, being um, marginalized and brutalized, you know, not only in that scene, but just watching this and also being a mom, a mom to girls and boys. But that's the kind of, you know, but shifting and you talked about a little bit, Michael, like shifting that kind of that, you know, thing where we're going to beat up everybody. It's not really reasonable to do that. I don't actually have a problem with that. If someone is a violent racist, I don't have a problem with them being beat up, but I can't do that right now. Um, Cause I don't want to go to jail, but if somebody's doing that, I, you know, you know, the world of rights and wrongs, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I had to find other ways because I had to survive to address that um, violence. So anyway, I'll stop there. But. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much, China. And I forgot to, my favorite way to introduce China is to say she was 16, 125 pounds and beat Nazi ass many, many times, many, many times. And uh, we have a surprise uh, addition to our panel. Um, Mike Crenshaw is joining us. And I, I'm wondering if Mike, you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, we're, we're just sort of talking about our experience with the panel and the book and sort of touching into the times. And then we're going to go to an audience Q and a thanks for joining us. Sure. It's great to see everybody here. Um, hey, comrades, I, I um, am going to be looking at the questions as they come in and just attempting to do some co-facilitation. Hopefully I'll contribute uh, in a helpful way, but um yeah, I'm I'm excited about uh, the support that is showing up for the book, and it it feels to me like people all over the country are fired up in a way that could uh, be the beginning of the current level of movement building um, that we need to respond to what's happening. And uh, I'll pass it back to you guys. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think we're uh, going to hear from Liberty. Do you have some questions for the growing panel? Yeah, no, this is great. I'm so glad we've got all of y'all here. Um, and I, I think, Mo, you did a great job of setting us up with information about the book. But I want to emphasize to folks that if they have not listened to the podcast, they need to go listen to it. This is absolutely one of the best podcasts I've ever listened to. I think it's extremely relevant to the present day, um, very well produced, uh, does a great job of getting into the complexities. So please, if you haven't already heard the podcast, go listen to it. It's, it's worth your time. Um, and if you've listened to the podcast, definitely pick up the book. Um, the book is such a uh, deep resource, which is absolutely not uh, just a transcript, as you said, um, of the content of the podcast. I was actually quite surprised when I started spending time with the book, um, how much additional content it is. Uh, the multimedia content um, is so rich. I think the, the photos and flyers that are present there really um, bring all the stories to life in a way that I think is just invaluable. 
Um, and the range of voices is just amazing. Y'all have done such a good job. I really strongly encourage people to both engage with the podcast and the book. Um, and I, I will say, as someone who is constantly looking around my own community for oral histories and a better understanding of how we got to where we are, I feel so jealous that um, that we don't have a resource like this. And of course, obviously, there's no one resource that tells a complete story. Um, and this is just one snapshot from Portland of one kind of one moment, one movement. Uh, but it is incredible. And I hope that it actually inspires people to do this type of oral history making in other cities and other places, because I know that that every city um, uh, has its own kind of history that maybe isn't always as, as deep as Portland's, but like, uh, I, it's something that I'm looking for. Um, so maybe just as a kind of initial question to ask here, it, it seems like something that really made uh, this kind of like movement against white supremacists in Portland in the 80s and 90s uh, effective um, and also very interesting to talk about is that there were so many different organizations and kind of such a, I guess, a, people coming from a lot of different political and social kind of backgrounds and seemingly able to work together pretty effectively um, to confront uh, Nazis at the time. And that's something that I'm really curious about. And I'm wondering if anybody could speak to um, just the degree to which organizations were able to effectively move together um, or or not at times. I mean, I think uh, th in the podcast and the book, there's some kind of hint of tensions, but it seems like to a large extent, people were very, very generous with each other. Um, I'd love to hear more about that because it seems to be a missing ingredient a lot of times in our movements. Just anyone that's, that's open to sharing, yeah. Um, I think... I think that that's a very important part. I think one of the things uh, th that I experienced in development there, um, many, many different people with different objectives. Jonathan talked about compiling information. Um, it was hard to know who was who back then or who had been at Aryan Nations over the summer and then was coming back in to infiltrate um, a group or a scene that you might be part of. Um, as far as uh, as far as my experience in the skinhead anti-racist community, um, countless different crews um, leaning towards different political ideation with a solid cohesion on anti-racism and the fact that um, we were sick of the white supremacist being everywhere we went and had had enough. And so while there were crews with anti-misogynist, anti-homophobia, um, all really agendified and very clear cut rules about who could and could not be a member and what was and was not allowed, those ran the spectrum across like six to 10 different crews at any different time but we had anti-racism as a common bond and we all did know each other and give respect to each other. And if there were six crews at Pine Street and someone showed up with a swastika, they were let know real, real quickly by every anti-racist skinhead in the place that we were one and that that was unacceptable. So I think that that really just brought that together as a putting a foot down in, in our city. I, I also just want to <clears throat> briefly, um, again, I was very young, but some, something that like stood out to me is that one of the, in looking at it from my perspective, which my mom, her friends were activists doing the work kind of on the activist and the policy level and going out into rural parts of Oregon and like knocking on doors and trying to change people's minds. And like, that is one of the kind of, when I look at it and I see the network of, of people from on the ground to would never even say the word, like stomp someone <laughs> like they're, you know, buttoned up going to the, to the buttoned up people to talk about anti-racism or to talk about legislation or whatever. 
I think that was the success from my understanding is that you had people who were willing to fight. You had people who were willing to try and reason with people by being like, you've never met a, you know, a, a person or you've never, and they did it across, but it was very like across messaging. And so anyway, that's what I just think of is like, that was one of the, the things that came out of his murder. And then the movement building was that it wasn't just skinheads and fighters. It was a lot of people who were super freaked out and, and very like, how could this happen in Portland? But if you've done any research on Portland, you know exactly how it happened. And it's super not shocking to you. What's shocking is that like that little baby struggle, like we won, you know, like we won in quotes because Portland is exactly the place where it would happen. So. One of the things I, I think I about, think this is, oh, sorry, go ahead, John. I was just going to say, this is more of a, uh, uh, something that Jonathan might want to respond to because I think the, the coalition for human dignity really did the hard work of bringing a lot of diverse groups together. I'll, I'll take that as a cue. Thanks, John. Um, <laughs> um, th that cross-fertilization between folks who, you know, in the normal course of a day would never cross paths um, was you know, one of the unique contributions that the Coalition for Human Dignity made. And folks who were doing the community organizing, not, not so much me, I did mostly research, but they, they set about intentionally to bring folks together. How did it work both ways? Well, when you had the uh, head of the Lesbian Community Project, a major figure within the gay and LGBTQ community, willing to go and, you know, be at a vigil protecting anti-racists from physical attacks from neo-Nazi skinheads. You know, Donna Redwing went to a home, went to an apartment, right? And, you know, stood vigil there while folks protected, um, you know, their community from attack. And, and it worked the other way. It meant that, you know, lesbian and gay folks who were under attack by the Christian right had to deal with militant anti-racists. Um, and, and you saw, you know, uh, working class anti-racist skinheads at anti-OCA events. This was huge. This and this did not happen um, by accident. That was, you know, there were folks intentionally organizing to do that. And it ruffled feathers. Um, that was it was not easy to, to carry that kind of work out. Um, and the book really helps bring back those stories. Uh, and so. That uh, now, you know, on the other hand, coalitions can be notoriously difficult to maintain. You have competing interests, you have cross, you know, uh, mutually exclusive, um, you know, politics. The Sharps should be too patriotic. ARA was too ideological. The Coalition for Human Dignity is, well, whatever, run from the shop, you know, what, whatever, you know, people had um, stuff. And we argued, folks argued. Um, and let, let me just say this lastly, that um, as an analog from then to today, um, you know, anti-fascists in Portland and the Pacific Northwest, as well as elsewhere, um, have assembled these coalitions, Pop Mob, Rose City Antifa, you know, um, the Pacific Northwest uh, Anti-Fascist Workers Collective, and many other groups um, have carried on in a tradition um, th that was like the Coalition for Human Dignity, Anti-Racist Action and Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice. And I think uh, in many ways, people have been um, uh, leery about supporting these groups today. And so part of what I'm here to tell you is, you know, if you're older, like we are, you know, we need to support those groups. They are the ARA and Sharps of yesterday. Um, bring them you know, money, platters of brownies, whatever, you know, um, they're doing the hard work. They really are and have been for years now. Uh, so I'll, I'll be quiet. Okay. I'm really I want to add you... something short. Oh, you're talking. I just want to add something quick about people coming together. Um, I just want to say definitely there was people organizing it, but also you can't underestimate just like 
you know, people, community comes together organically and naturally and people needed each other. And, you know, like the, the group that I was with, which was like street kids and stuff, they were like, we we're punks, skins, rockers, whatever. We were there as community naturally. You know, we were there together. Nobody had put us together. Um, we had like different, uh, like as a punk rocker, I didn't agree with, you know, the order of, the, you know, like skinhead order, but we were there discussing and naturally coming together, you know, cause that's just human nature too. And it comes out of people having necessity, you know, you need to come together. It's not just someone needs to, you know, orchestrate you and put you together. You come together because you need each other. And something I always think about, like when I was in Chicago at the time, um, and we were doing a lot of support work where we would just show up and support other people's things instead of start an organization. Um, but, you know, AIDS was happening and it was a huge threat and it was terrifying. And gay people were not protected. Queer people were not were were differently vulnerable in, in, in big, really huge ways and act up provided a model, a support model for that with being confrontational. So it was easier to be a member of the gay community and also be in a, in a place of confronting in a like very upfront confrontational um, manner of uh, addressing, like standing up for your own rights. And so Scott Nakagawa really speaks to that in his experience of bridging that. And one of the things I really loved about what he said on the podcast was that queer people are natural bridges because we come from every place. We're in every family. We're in every class. We're in, we're everywhere. And we are frequently not welcome in all of the places that we are native to. And, and we do find each other, like China said, and Mike always brings this up, like, people were friends and and also Portland was a tiny little scene and it's something that like I said I was in Chicago at the time and so there you know when we were writing the podcast I kept asking Icky and Aaron I was like Alec and Aaron I was like if people got their asses beat why did they go to the why did they go to these shows what were the kids thinking you know because I it's not my nature to like go hang out somewhere where I was gonna get my ass beat but it was the, it was there was weird. nowhere else to go right there was exactly. nowhere we could go except for these shows that was where every all our community was and just really quick about the coalition piece that i think is it, it, important at least to my some of my experience is um both i did a lot of photography around um the oregon citizens alliance which was the anti-gay group like our protests against them i did a lot of um just because of my queer adjacentness um act up was doing a lot of protesting so one of the main one thing that's so important about citizen and community coalitions and and i think it speaks to this time is because the the organization that <laughs> we think is going to protect us was part of the problem and so, you know, I'd be pulling out of the nightclub that we would hang out downtown and it would be like me and my like femme best friend. And then like this kid from Tennessee or I don't remember where Ian was from, but just some super crazy tattooed swastikas crossed out all over his body, had a, you know, figured shit out too late for his tattoos. Um, and a cop car pulled in back of our car and stopped us from leaving. And they came around and they were like, Hey, Coyote, how's it going? How's your boyfriend? Naming my boyfriend at the time. Who's this kid? And we were like, just a kid. Like, he's just a guy. And they're like, what's your name? Where are you? I mean, like, crazy shit. And it wasn't the first time I had a cop come up to me on public transportation. Hey, Coyote, how are you? You know, you have a file. We know all about you. What? <laughs> you know, so like, that's why coalition is so important. And it wasn't just from my hanging out with these guys. It was because of my mom and the queer activism. There were people in the OCA who made threats against me when I was in college. Like that's why coalition is so crucial to any kind of movement happening because the call is coming from inside the house. Not good. 
And just a point of information for people who aren't familiar with the OCA, the Oregon Citizens Alliance, it was a Christian right, basically a hate group um, that was headed by a man named Lon Maybon, who made an unsuccessful bid for um, legislation and then just disappeared. But uh, he mobilized a bunch of people to pass legislation all across Oregon and people weren't organized and it passed and it basically outlawed queer people from existing in various forms um, of outlaw. And there was a big uh, push, I think it was in 1992 to pass something called Measure 9. And there was a lot of uh, coalition, broad, broad coalition support. And the thing to remember also is in 1992 in October was when, oh no, excuse me, never mind. But yeah, that's what OCA is. I think now would be a good time to go into some of the audience Q&A and we do have a bunch of really great questions coming in. I would um, encourage folks to continue submitting, uh, although we may not get to 100% of them. Uh, but I think a, a good segue might be picking up, um, you know, Jonathan mentioned, uh, kind of looking at the evolution uh, or kind of like kind of the way in which these anti-racist movements, particularly street movements have kind of translated into our present moment, um, you know, from uh, ARA uh, to the torch network, um, kind of Antifa, um, if folks use that term. Um, and I guess maybe on the flip side of that, uh, I know that y'all saw kind of some of the early stages of the kind of like I guess uh, the kind of 90s transformation of street-based white supremacy uh, into kind of the suit and tie fascism. Um, I'm curious uh, what y'all think about kind of the, the evolution of uh, organized white supremacy um, uh, from the period in which you were active together to the present moment and maybe how things look different or the same. And and this is this is building off of a question that was submitted um, about key differences between white supremacist groups uh, that y'all dealt with versus groups like the Proud Boys, Rise Above Movement, and Patriot Front. Um, I was I was reading that question in the Q and A section a little earlier. Um, I think it's really important to say clearly. Um, the only difference is the public facing version that you see, um, it is exactly the same ideology, the same hate leads to the same place. It is whitewashed to the point, um, I'm in the construction trades. I work with gentlemen that by any description of mine, I would say are essentially unacknowledged uh, white privileged white supremacists who believe that we really aren't so far apart, the movement is selling loss of your identity in a sense without preaching the hate, but they are, they are the same group. And I think the messaging now has kind of morphed to just be attractive to more people. Um, if you talk to anyone in the general public who doesn't have a real, who isn't really politically active, or who is just witnessing these things that are happening in our society, what? They're just proud guys. They're not so bad. Um, Enrique can't be racist. He's brown. Um, all of these real arguments, and that was touched on a little bit by China earlier, um, the fact of the matter is that you can be this full of hate no matter what color you are no matter what color tie you're wearing, and that we just need to recognize that on a human level and be ready and be willing to call people out on their BS. Because I don't care how you package it, you know, if it smells like shit, it's shit. That's it. Yeah, so, sometimes, um... I feel like the differences that um, I see with the right is that the guys we were fighting in the streets really embraced being the bad guy and being the villain. 
And today, um, those guys pretend that they're not the bad guy and they pretend that they're not the villain. Um, but they do have the same message as you were saying, Michael. And um, they also have the same type of relationship with the police and, um, you know, with law enforcement. And, they, and they're the ones who get, you know, when they have their um, protests or demonstrations, they have police protection. When there's leftist protests and demonstrations, um, you know, our friends get attacked by the police. Um, I really agree that it's it's the same it's the same message. Um, you know, like to piggyback off something that you, that you've kind of hinted at, and and China and um, being a parent um, and and having kids has kind of changed some of my perspective on violence and how and what I want my children's experience to be like in the world. You know. Um, a lot of the violence that we did um, had some effect. You know, one we failed at a lot of stuff, but we successfully ran Nazi open Nazi skinheads off the streets of Portland, and that felt pretty good. And I felt like it made a safer environment for for people, especially for the LGBTQ community. Well, those uh, characters have come back now, like with a vengeance, and they're not fighting on the streets. They're Change, they're passing laws, they're passing anti-trans laws, like the the hateful rhetoric against the LGBTQ community, I've never seen it so extreme. Um, so, you know, we didn't really, we didn't really win, you know, the fight isn't, isn't really over and there's a lot of work to do still. Um, if I could just kick in here briefly it's uh, you know we had a tactical victory if you will you know we we had but we didn't you know we won the battle lost the war apparently um and uh, at the risk of oversimplifying things um uh, which i will probably do anyways uh there's an old anecdote about how uh sort of regular oppression which is horrible day-to-day -day exploitation um racism and so on um uh is is uh carried out by a ruling class that's in power they're they're running stuff um uh, but fascism if we're to distinguish it at all from sort of regular every day-to-day -day misery um it is has to be something different it has to have a a part of you know why it does what it does that's different from a regular sort of capitalist system right and well one of these anecdotes is that during um, world war ii um uh, hitler very famously um diverted trains from his war effort against the soviet union to make sure that jews got carried to concentration camps okay so in other words something was more important to him than money or even the war and it was killing Jews, all right? Now, this is an oversimplification, but my point here is this, that regular sorts of business people look at all sorts of communities as sources of wealth. They wanna take uh, your labor and make money with it and rule. But fascists, if we're to distinguish them, um, have a different agenda. That agenda is genocide. And it's so in one sense, you could say that fascists pepper uh, our history in the United States. You, you could argue that, you know, the, the history of white settlerism, the history of anti-black racism and slavery was about that, at least in part. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to say this, that there is something that has changed from back then in the late 1980s to now. Um, and I think this is part of it. It's not the whole part of it. OK, but but it's a piece of it. And it's that the far right and the fascists, um, that genocidal component of their ideology is now in the political mainstream. And that, to me, is terrifying. So I'll leave it there. And if I could just speak on that, just to because yeah. what I was thinking about was you know, we're talking essentially about this, um, this time where something, an act of violence happened that was so horrifying to an entire city 
that it shifted. But I mean, we've had like tons of those in the last couple of years and no one gives a shit because we're, because that's not, it's not the same world anymore. We see it constantly. That flashpoint that happened in Portland was like this moment in time, pre-internet, pre-cell phones, pre-all of that. I mean, Jonathan was talking about clipping services, which I laughed at because like probably no one knows what that is, but I feel like, or under a certain age, but, um, but those flashpoints happen so often that, that, that isn't happening. That isn't shaming us into action or horrifying us into change. Yeah. I, I wanted to uh, speak to a question in the uh, from the attendees about Minneapolis and if there seemed to be a connection to what happened in Minneapolis and what was happening in Portland. I think that there were there were d direct connections historically between uh, members of the Baldies and anti-racist action in Minneapolis and direct lines of communication to sharp skinheads in Portland who were also working with Coalition for Human Dignity. Um, there were scene reports in different zines that let people around the country in, in the hardcore punk scene um, know what was happening. And so we would get word of the Nazi problem in Portland in Minneapolis through scene reports. There were young people who were part of the scene who were traveling with bands as roadies or in bands themselves who had toured. And so through word of mouth, people in Minneapolis understood uh, that there was a real big Nazi problem in Portland and some people reached out and there was a number of people from Minneapolis Baldies and ARA and Chicago, skinheads of Chicago, another anti-racist skinhead crew and ARA chapter in Chicago who took a road trip to Portland and did some uh, material support and aided in some community defense. So that was the direct person to person, um, I guess, string of events that created a relationship in a broader, more general sense, demographically and culturally, Portland and Minneapolis were two of uh, the whitest and yet in an urban sense, most liberal mid-sized cities in the United States. So you had a large amount of young people who had been raised in liberal progressive uh, center to left leaning homes who were part of the punk scene. And so their ideological orientation was during the Reagan years was identifying that something was wrong in this society and they wanted to commit. And the, the radical anti-authoritarian uh, subculture of the punk scene was a perfect place for them to express themselves, you know? And I think we see that in the United States of America, if there's a time for for young people who are somewhat conscious and aware to be to be radical, it is in their youth before the privilege um, that they might inherit as as adults starts to encourage them to you know have different priorities. And the punk scene was one of those places where that expressed itself, both in Minneapolis and in Portland. Then there, I was also asked to speak to this issue of you know when we see people of color uh, participating in white supremacy, um, whether that's racist or not. You know, we have people like, there were always some Nazi skinheads who were Latino or or um, mixed race. And, you know, there's, it's a complex issue being raised in the society and identifying with your oppressor as a, a, a product of the trauma and internalized self-hate that we deal with being in an environment where you're constantly uh, ridiculed and violently assaulted and attacked may encourage people to not want to identify with their ethnic identity. But when when people of color participate in white supremacy, it has a different, um, I think, characteristic than overt racism of white folks participating in white supremacy because we people of color don't historically have the structural power that white folks have. So even though we can be racially prejudiced against our own kind or against other people, um, we're not operating in the structural and systemic way that that white folks get to participate in when they're being uh, racist themselves. 
Thank you for those really fantastic insights. Um, I want to pick up on another Q&A question that has come in that I think uh, builds off of things that have already been discussed, both in terms of, I think there was a brief mention of infiltration. Um, you know, Coyote also talked about the role of police um, in kind of disrupting and targeting movement. Um, and, and certainly the book talks also about the way that the police targeted the Baldies uh, in Minneapolis. Um, uh, so yeah, we've got a, a question in the Q and A um, from someone who says, "I'm curious about security in organizations, and if there are any anecdotes from the panel about weeding out possible infiltration." And I imagine here that infiltration might be both police infiltration, but also far right infiltration. And I say far right and police as if those are necessarily distinct categories, and they aren't. But um, but if we could cover any of that territory, I think that would be really interesting to hear about. Um, I don't know if I can answer this from like some sort of surveillance or, you know, knowing place, but I think when you talk about rooting out, you know, people that could be spies, you have to realize that anyone could be compromised in these movements at any point. We're not, we're not really so safe. I guess I would say if you're really doing the, the work here, you're not, you're not in, you, you know, who do you, I'm not telling you not to trust people, but I'm just saying keep it real and be and be aware that anyone could be compromised. Your conversation could be compromised. You know, someone could be watching you. I mean, there's many ways to be compromised. It's not, I don't, I don't know if there's so many, and there's definitely spies and stuff, but I think you just have to be aware of, of you know, depends on how serious the work that you're doing is. Um, but anyone could compromise the the situation. And I just think you have to be always be aware of, of that. I think it's probably not a great use of time to try to figure out who's a spy, because that's a technique that's been used, um, you know, historically multiple times, Cointelpro, and then again, like with the Muslim community, you know, turning communities against each other, um, historically turning communities of color against each other. I'm, that's my main orientation is communities of color. So I think you have to, to have a level of trust with everyone, but also realize that, you know, you could be compromised and could be compromised um, inadvertently. Um, and I also wanted to speak a little bit to, you know, talking about this violence. I mean, the USA is a violent country and it was founded on violence. So let's not pretend like we can avoid violence. Our very presence in the world is an act of violence. I mean, if you consider that the United States government funds, um, you know, Israel who is daily um, bombing Palestine, this is our tax dollars go to this, you know? We are not innocent and being here, even no matter how bad we want to not be part of it, we are, blood is still on our hands. I don't like it. I am um, descendant of enslaved Africans. I don't like to feel like that, but as an American, that's the reality that our country is. And there's a lot of different things, different directions we could take to discuss that. Like, how do we unpack that and how do we fix? I don't think we're gonna come up with a solution, but let's just keep it real you know, who we are and where we're at and the privileges that we have. Thank you. Um, as a very quick uh, and direct answer to the question of infiltration, let me just say that the best way to protect our movements, our organizations, our comrades from infiltration is counterintelligence. What, what does that mean? It means infiltrating them. You got to, you know what they're thinking, know what they're planning, know what they're having for breakfast, preferably. Okay. And if you don't have, a, you know, an intelligence capacity, if you don't make the decision, if your group, your crew, you know, makes the decision, ah, we don't want to do that. Or if you make the decision that the risks of, um, you know, becoming paranoid are too high. Then you leave it to someone else to carry out that work. And that's okay. You can do that. But whatever you do, don't argue against somebody doing it. Because back in the day, people did. And this, this is, I mean, you got to have somebody doing it. The uh, best way to keep them from infiltrating you, steal their fucking files. We did. We stole the files from the Portland Police Bureau. I should say I did, personally. Uh, unredacted intelligence reports that gave us a better insight into 
you know, the nature of the state repression and whatnot than anything we had, you know, managed to, to get. Um, it's possible to do, right? You got to push the envelope. You have to be audacious. Um, and so, you know, and folks are doing that kind of work. And we, uh, those, the today's contemporary Antifa does that work. The, and much of that is online infiltration, hacking, and doxing. Critical stuff, really critical stuff. How, how do we know it's critical? Because it's been used against us for so long. It's so disruptive. It is so, it's serious stuff too. Um, but don't, you know, this is what I would ask of liberals and other folks, pacifists, right? Uh, I respect your pacifism, okay? Then you need to respect our ability to go after them. That's it, okay? And that's how you you got to work that. Um, and too many people don't do that. They don't uphold that agreement. Um, and that's another discussion. I'm sorry, I said that was going to be quick. It wasn't. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to say that really it's kind of a relative question and that I think you have to think in terms of where you're at with direct action and what type, what types of risks you're creating for yourself or the people that you're, uh, doing community work with, um, as has been alluded to, um, we had a problem in the late eighties, early nineties with fence sitters. They were friends with three of my friends. Yeah, they kind of seemed like a Nazi, but I wasn't, you know, it was like a don't ask, don't tell thing. But we had a very real problem with that um, on a level of acceptance out of some like backwards uh, reverse good old boy crap. But if you're going to be participating in direct action and putting yourself at real risk, you know, we just we just went through politics where if they could tag you as Antifa, you were an enemy of the state. We were at protests here in Portland where uh, speaking on a loudspeaker got you instantly shot by the police. Like there are real risks to this. So if, if the person asking these questions is in direct action, know your circle, period. And don't be doing dangerous direct action stuff that could have physical or legal consequences with people that you don't know. And I'm not trying to sound like a convict, but but the reality is the police would just as happily scoop you up and toss you in jail and throw away the key and have one last person of conscience to deal with. So you really have to ask yourself uh, how deep you're getting into things and uh, how close you're gonna keep your circle for that kind of stuff. I want to say again, um, kind of think going back to what Jonathan was saying, I was thinking about it. This is a great because there's a lot of all these questions about what can allies do for communities of color. And I get it. This isn't exactly that conversation. But, you know, different communities have different um, needs, like some communities cannot afford to go and dox each other. We're small, but other communities, you have that duty, like what Jonathan is doing is incredibly important. We need that. And he can do that in his capacity as a white man, you know, um, for, you know, maybe our smaller communities of color. It's it's going to cause problems to maybe go after each other in the same way. I mean, that's just my take on it. So I think really and also what you kind of said, Michael, is realizing who you're with and what your community, the community that you're working with and understanding your capacity and what your role is within that community and, and utilizing the privileges that you may have. the allyship you can bring. I just saw a question and um, it was, a, I think it came a while ago about what are the anti-fascists of today doing wrong? And I, uh, I don't know that I want to paint with a broad brush um, that has a label on it, what we're doing wrong. But one of the things that I think we need to work on which is something that, that has been a bit timeless in, in my participation in this culture, is that uh, we need to work on the type of agreements we have to support each other publicly um, and to work on dealing with our disagreements and confidentiality. Um, I think we're not all going to agree. Um, some of us, will make human mistakes and cause harm based on levels of understanding and consciousness 
based on their own unhealed wounds, right? But we can't be tearing each other up and tearing each other down and on social media um, because those are vulnerabilities that are going to be exploited by the state and by our enemies. Uh, and then to the second part of that question was, these, these Nazis are still showing up at, at the drag shows at the library and there's nobody there to resist them. And so, you know, whether or not that is a reflection of us doing something wrong or not doing enough, I'm always going to encourage us to do uh, what we can in our communities. But if we see a problem, we have to be willing to resolve it, not by ourselves and in, in, in some way that's full of bravado that's going to get ourselves or other people hurt. But by figuring out how can what's the safest way that we can do this respond to this problem and increase the impact that we have on our enemy and with the least amount of damage to us and often that is when you have a multi-tiered coalition of people there are going to be people doing intelligence work there are going to be people doing physical direct action there are going to be people doing media work and now social media work and there are going to be people who are behind the scenes bringing food and 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 being medics and taking people to the hospital and all of that and that work takes time so if nobody's showing up to uh defend the drag show next week maybe 90 days from now there's going to be a strong group out there and just to piggyback on that because I feel like that's the message right is that um if you're not seeing it you have to create it and that's just absolutely across the board and I think that one of the things that I've loved in my life of seeing protests and seeing all the ways that people protested like um I had a couple of teachers that were queer when I was in middle school and they marched in pride but with bags over their head and I only knew they were gay because I was doing lesbian community project mailings. And I was like, oh, what's up, teacher plus teacher on the same address. And because I was a very well-known um, outer of people, because I just, my gaydar was as a child. Um, but one of the things that I love seeing is creative, loud protests. Like um, the people who, uh, I did radical cheerleading. And so when the OCA went to my high school, when I was, older and out of college and I was like so offended by it I was like how fucking dare not the OCA the weird the um the no God hates people with the west the church people anyway when they went to my high school I was like how dare they go to my high school like we were protesting against the war we were walking out we were at Pioneer Square protesting racism like how dare you step foot and so we showed up with you know pom-poms and cheers that were rehearsed and we were loud and we were colorful and we were distracting and so you know the the people who wore angel wings and blocked the the same church from the the funerals of of like folks being protested by those monsters um so what are the ways that you can do all of the things and then also if you like with the drag shows like then get loud, get louder, because they're not creative. They are just hate filled. So. Um, I just wanted to respond a little bit to the um, question about infiltration. And I like Oregon went through a and, and I think part of the reason it's difficult to connect with people here is we're still feeling the effects of the green scare where a bunch of activists were arrested and it was discovered that there was an infiltrator in the group who was quite close in, who had been turned by the police. Um, and I think the level of brutality that we're living in just by existing in capitalism is something that we really need to remember. And um, several people in the podcast and the book, including China, Cecil Prescott, were just like, take care of each other, take care of yourself, ground yourself. Um, you can't make healthy decisions in your intuition when you're in a state of extreme scarcity and paranoia and um, you don't know where you're going to be living and you in your food situation. Like if you're just constantly in a state of extreme hypervigilance, it looks like every, everyone is out to get you. So just like really practice great personal mental hygiene and try and get as grounded as you can. And like Michael said, know who you are standing with. And um, 
you know, making connections and supporting each other horizontally instead of attacking each other. Right now, I feel like many people are afraid to voice opinions on social media for fear of being attacked and legitimately torn down. And some of that may be right wing trolls and fascists, but some of them are people maybe we've known for many years who are in pain. And so I would say when those things happen, hear them as a request to belong, hear them as a statement of pain and go at things with curiosity and find that third road through the binary where you just say like, there's this and there's that, but what's the third way through? Like you're attacking me for not including a, a subset that you feel like should be here what what is missing in your life that you feel like that is something you need to bring to this so and and one more thing like jason really brought up in the book and the podcast and in talks as far as the drag queens um ask the drag queens how they would like to be supported and then see what you can do to support them you know and i as somebody that was in a big loud agit prop group, the Amalgamated Everlasting Union Chorus, we worked with the radical cheerleaders many times and showing up in outfits and having more fun than the fascists is always an excellent form of attack. And we always have Mike for being fascists. <laughs> uh, I know we're almost out of time. Um, this you know, this event's called Build, Building Community Defense. And I'm just reflecting on the fact that, um, you know, the Minneapolis Baldies started with a group of friends who loved and cared about each other. The Portland Baldies started with a group of friends who've loved and cared about each other. There's three people here tonight who were at my sentencing in um, the early 90s. And um, I really think that the real key to the beginning of any of this, to all of this is building community. And that might be just talking to your neighbors or, or giving a shit how people in your neighborhood are doing, whether it's the drag queens or the other parents or or whatever. But um, I really think that building community is is the beginning of all of this. I think on that note, we will have to end. This has been uh, an incredible conversation. I appreciate all the insights and um, wisdom that y'all have brought. I know that Y'all are all very clear that you're not presenting yourselves as experts or heroes, um, but your story is really inspiring. And it's also inspiring that you're still showing up um, and passing this down um, and doing the work. So thank you for everything that you have done and that you're continuing to do. Um, it means a lot to me that you were able to join us tonight. And thanks to everyone in the audience who was able to tune in. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all the questions, uh, but I hope everyone has a great night and that we are able to connect again in the future.